turn on the recording now. So we are recording. And if there's, hopefully you're all okay with that. <laughs> okay, um, on that note, I am going to turn it over to Kristen. We can go ahead and switch slides and Kristen is going to give a brief intro to our speaker, Heather Schneider. All right, go for it, Kristen. Great, thank you. Thanks for all that uh, info, Melissa. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We have a pretty nice crowd um, and I really appreciate it um, being able to stay connected with everyone through this time via Zoom. I'm really excited about our presentation tonight. So I'm really glad that you all are joining us. Um, I did wanna just mention, I thought it might be fun, no obligation, but um, because we do have such a nice crowd and I think the advertising for this was kind of far and wide, if you're inclined, um, drop into the chat window and let us know if you are a CNPS member or if you're not, where you're joining us from. Um, I'll just be checking that periodically and I thought that would be kind of interesting to see uh, how far reaching our advertising got for this talk. Um, I also just wanted to mention, I, this was on the previous screen and I think Melissa mentioned it, but we will do Q&A at the end. Um, but because of the format, you can feel free to drop any questions in that chat window. We'll keep track of it um, throughout the talk so you can put it in there at any time and then we'll deal with all of that at the end. So uh, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Heather Schneider as our speaker tonight. If you don't know Dr. Schneider, uh, she does amazing work down at Santa Barbara Botanical Garden. Um, she earned her PhD at UC Riverside. And while she was down there, she studied the impacts of nitrogen pollution on invasive and native annuals in the fragile desert ecosystem, which is a, a place after my own heart. I love the desert. Um, from there, she continued her work in the desert, researching the health and habitat of desert tortoises with the US Geological Survey. And then in 2013 is when she landed in Santa Barbara, working as a postdoc scholar down there at UCSB and working on a very cool project. Um, it was a nationwide project to create the first research seed bank dedicated to studying the evolution of wild plants. Very cool project. Um, after that, she joined the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden in her current position starting in 2016. And in this role, Heather oversees the Rare Plant Conservation Program, uh, which uses a combination of field, lab, and greenhouse work to understand, protect, and restore California's rare plants, which is why you're all here tonight. Um, fun fact, in this work, Heather has used many interesting means of travel to complete her, her field assignments, um, which includes small planes, boats, mules, and helicopters. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about that tonight. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing before I turn it over. You know, I, I personally have heard so much about the awesome conservation work that they're doing down there at SBBG, which is why I invited Heather here tonight. So I'm, I'm super glad to have her. I hope you're all equally as excited as I am. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our speaker. So Heather, take it away. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Today I'm gonna focus on the conservation seed banking part of our program and try to give you a little bit of an idea of all the things that play into making those seed collections. And just to start, I wanna do a quick land acknowledgement. So this map shows the ancestral homelands and territories of indigenous people in California. And I just want to acknowledge that our field work spans a large portion of Central California, and these areas represent rich indigenous history. Our work focuses especially on the ancestral lands of the Chumash, Yokuts, and Monachi people, and these are lands that were stolen from them. We traverse these invaluable natural spaces with a sense of humility and gratitude for the conservationists and indigenous people who came before us and from whom we still have much to learn. So thank you very much. And I'm going to start out really basic just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, what is a rare plant? I think a lot of people have an idea of what this is. And the definition is really simple. It's just a plant that is uncommon. But the ways that plants become rare are 
uh, very nuanced. And so sometimes it's because there are few individuals of a given species. Sometimes rare plants are locally abundant, but they exist in a really narrow geographic area. And sometimes we have a combination of those two things where there are very few individuals in a very small geographic space. And those are the plants that we worry about the most. And here in California, we're really lucky to have a super diverse flora. Uh, we are a global biodiversity hotspot and we have the most kinds of native plants of any state in the US. And we have over 8,000 kinds of plants and that's what this chart represents. Um, the green, yellow, and blue represent our more than 6,500 kinds of native plants in California. And that red slice of the pie is 1,500 different kinds of non-native plants. And this doesn't mean that they're necessarily invasive plants or that they're inflicting ecological damage, but they did not evolve in California and were brought from somewhere else. But I want you to focus on that, that gold and blue sliver of the pie. And those are our rare plants in California. More than a third of the plants in the state are considered rare. And that light blue slice is uh, anything that has state or federal protection under the Endangered Species Act. And you can see that that is just a real small portion of our rare plants in California. And so many rare plants don't enjoy the protections of the California Endangered Species Act or the Federal Endangered Species Act. But we do have the California Native Plant Society and CNPS has their inventory of rare and endangered plants and they rank them um, and help us understand what plants are imperiled in the state. And of these 35% of our flora, you know, 2000 kinds of rare plants, more than 45% of them only occur in 10 places in the state. And so there's much work to be done. And since this talk is about seed banks, I wanna make sure we all know what a conservation seed bank is. I think that this is a term that has become much more well known in the public sphere in the last several years. And a lot of it is due to the publicity that the Svalbard Global Seed Vault has been getting. So a lot of times when we think of seed banks, people start picturing this futuristic um, vault in the side of a mountain on an island in Norway protected by permafrost. Um, but most seed banks are not quite that glamorous. A little background music for the talk. Um, yeah, is that a little background uh, noise? Someone serenading us, but if you don't mind muting yourself, that would be awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, this is the Pritzloff Conservation Center at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, and this is where our seed bank lives. Um, like the Svalbard Seed Vault, it is underground, it's in our basement, but it looks like this. And this is what you'll find in most um, botanic gardens that have conservation seed banks. They're just chest freezers, but they're full of invaluable genetic material. And you can see that we keep them in these little like weatherproof totes. We do that because we're very acutely aware of the risk of fire at our garden. Um, the garden burned in 2009 and the Jesusita fire. And in the event that we need to evacuate our seeds, we have them in these storage containers with uh, ice packs so that they can stay cool. But we also have multiple temperature alarms. We have two kinds of power backup for the seed bank. And it is underground in the most fireproof building we can have. Um, so we go to great lengths to make sure that these seeds are safe in our, in our seed bank. And our collection is made up of more than 700 different accessions and they represent more than 200 different kinds of native plants, mostly rare plants. Um, our oldest collection is Nipomo lupin from 1985, and we are a Center for Plant Conservation Regional Seed Bank. So this means that we have been approved and accredited by the Center for Plant Conservation as a seed bank that adheres to international and national standards, and we can receive seeds from people throughout California and store them for them. And then I just have these seed images here to give you a really tiny glimpse into the amazing diversity of seed morphology. 
Um, I think that, you know, seeds are as beautiful as the plants they come from and, uh, and they're very diverse in their shape and size and texture. Um, and so it's always fun to get to share that with people. And this is a map of the locations of our 700 collections uh, through 2019. Um, so you can see we get around, we're heavily focused on the Central Coast and the Channel Islands especially, uh, but we do make our way down into Baja um, and out into Northern California. And I'll be showing you uh, where we went this year and you'll see that we expanded our territory a little bit. And we have multiple funding streams for doing this kind of work. We're always writing grant proposals and trying to get contracts. But one really cool thing that happened in California is the California Biodiversity Initiative. And this is something that Jerry Brown signed in 2018 before he uh, finished his term as our governor. And he was very environmentally minded and had the wherewithal to say, we need to make a serious investment in protecting California's natural biodiversity. And as part of that, he allocated $3 million toward seed banking California's rarest plants. And those are anything listed by the California Native Plant Society as 1B, which is their most critically imperiled ranking. Um, and so that was just a huge investment in conservation of plants in California, which was super exciting. And we are part of a group that is receiving and then implementing that funding. And that's called California Plant Rescue. And we're a group of mostly botanic gardens, but also CNPS, the Center for Plant Conservation, um, San Diego Zoo Global. And you can see all the little logos in the corner, hopefully. Um, and we formed in 2014 with the goal of getting at least 75% of California's rarest plants into conservation seed collections by 2020. The overall mission of the group is quite a bit larger. We're aiming to eventually have representative collections of the entire native flora of California protected in seed banks but we're starting with the rarest things. And so this chart shows the progress that we've made and how much we can do when we work together. So um, there are 1,177 CNPS 1B plants. Uh, before CAPER formed, 345 of those species were banked in conservation seed banks. And then you can see we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of years. I'm not sure with COVID and um, everything that happened this year, if we're gonna hit our 2020 goal, but I really think that that's attainable in the next couple of years. And with the California Biodiversity Initiative, our new goal and our mandate for the funding is to collect all of those CNPS 1Bs. Um, so we have a ton of work to do, <laughs> but it's great work and we're really excited about it. But how do we get from here, just this magical uh, field of wildflowers to here where seeds are safely stored in a conservation seed bank? So the work starts Come on. Uh, with research in the office and it, a lot goes into planning everything before we even set foot in the field. And I always say that the size of the freezer doesn't even begin to depict the number of hours that go into doing this kind of work. And so we start off with the basics and thinking about why are we making this collection? Um, are we doing it strictly for long-term conservation? Do we have a restoration or a research goal? Or is this something that we're going to try to reintroduce in a place where it's been locally extirpated? All of those questions inform the way that we make these collections. Then we have to figure out what our targets are. And this seems kind of obvious, but we only have so much time and resources. Um, and we have to figure out if we need permits for certain plants, if they're state or federally endangered. Um, and then we have to figure out where to collect. And that is involves a lot of research, looking at historic records of where plants have been found figuring out if we need permits, 
and then figuring out when we're going to go out. And this is kind of the hardest part because it changes every year depending on the timing and amount of rainfall. And we try to hit everything first when it's in peak bloom and then go back to collect seeds. So we're always trying to guess and figure out what the plants are doing and what their timeline is going to be this year. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we have to make multiple trips, but it's better to go too often than to be too late. Another major factor we have to think about when we're choosing our species is some of the seed traits. So in the seed world, uh, we think about seeds as orthodox or recalcitrant. Orthodox seeds are seeds that store really well in a conservation seed bank. They can tolerate being dried down to low moisture, which we do to prevent the water in the cells from bursting when we freeze the seeds so that we don't have any cellular damage. And they tolerate storage and live longer when they're cold and dry. So these are our main targets for conservation seed banking. And we're lucky in California because we have a lot of plants that are adapted to have long-lived seeds that store really well in a freezer. In places like tropical forests where plants make really big, often oily seeds, a lot of those are adapted to an environment where every year is good for germination and they don't store as well. And those are called recalcitrant seeds. So they don't tolerate drying, they don't live for a very long time, and we really can't store them in a conservation seed bank. And probably the most iconic species or, or genus in California that this pertains to is Quercus, the oaks. Um, this is something that people worldwide are thinking about. Oaks are really widely distributed globally and they're super important to native ecosystems. And so people have been doing a lot of research trying to figure out how we can store oaks. Part of that involves planting diverse stands at places like botanic gardens and living collections. So we have um, a living gene bank that's above ground instead of a living gene, gene bank that's in a freezer. Um, but people are also doing really interesting work trying to figure out how to excise embryos from acorns and give them different chemical washes to let them tolerate being frozen and liquid nitrogen. Um, really cutting edge, super interesting work. Um, and then like everything, this is a spectrum. So we also have seeds that are intermediate where they tolerate some drying and they might live for a little while longer in the fridge or the freezer, but they're not in it for the long haul like orthodox seeds. So for us, we mostly focus on orthodox seeds. And as Kristen mentioned, um, we have to figure out how we're gonna access our sites. And when I chose a career in botany, I did not envision all of the modes of transportation that I would be using, um, but we really have to have the right tool for the right job. And that pertains to transportation as well as anything else. So um, this is a video from Santa Cruz Island where we used a helicopter to get around to remote parts of the island where if we didn't have the helicopter, it would take us the better part of the day just to hike in. And so it really helps us do our work more efficiently. Um, and you also just feel really cool when you're in a helicopter. <laughs> it's super fun. It's a really amazing way to look at the earth from a different point of view. And then of course this year we had COVID. So that was something else we had to consider. We were really lucky that uh, most of the places that we were working allowed us to still access their property, um, but involved, of course, wearing masks if we couldn't be physically distant or if we were in a popular trail um, and we were taking separate vehicles and uh, just doing things a little bit differently this year, like everybody. So once we do all of our planning and we have everything lined up, the first step in the field and often my favorite is the scouting trips. This is when we go out, we try to hit things when they're in peak bloom. It's easier to find and identify most plants when they're flowering. And we make sure that we have the right target. A lot of rare plants can be a little bit difficult to identify and they can look like a common relative. And we wanna make sure we're collecting the right thing. One of the ways that we do that is by collecting a voucher specimen. This is um, an herbarium specimen. So we take a sample of a plant, we press it, we dry it, 
And then we put it in the herbarium, which is just a library of pressed plants. And that's our proof that we collected what we said we did. So the phrase, you know, I can vouch for that person. That's what you're doing. It's a voucher. This is our proof. Um, and then we collect a whole bunch of data that I'll tell you about in a minute. And we look at the plants and try to figure out what we think they're going to do. And we watch the weather. We're crazy storm trackers. <laughs> And tools of the trade, uh, field notebook is every botanist's best friend. Uh, we collect a lot of our data digitally now, but all of us still carry a notebook. We put most of our field voucher notes in there and just any little observations we're making. Um, one thing I noticed was that my hori hori is not in its sheath in this picture, but um, I use a hori hori. So here, this is, I'm collecting a voucher speci specimen of a rare lomatium um, in the Central Valley. And we collect GPS data about where our plants are. And we've been using the collector app for ArcGIS a lot where we can map uh, on an iPad, which is super helpful because you can really see where you are and you can import historic data and have all this reference with you in the field. Uh, so a lot of our data are being collected that way now. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of data that we collect. All these fields are now in our collector app, but we wanna have information about who's making the observations so that if we have questions, we know how to follow up. We take uh, information about the location of our plant, what type of habitat is it in, who are the associated species, did we see pollinators, how abundant is it. Uh, the phenology information is really helpful to us. So phenology is the timing of life cycle events. And so we want to know how many plants are vegetative, how many are flowering, are any of them making fruit yet, and that helps us get a handle on when we need to come back. And it helps us plan for next year. If we know I was here on May 5th and nothing was flowering, then I know I got there a little bit too early that year. And we also look at the overall site viability. Do we think that this is a place where this plant will thrive into the future? Are there any threats? Is there any disturbance? And then when we come back for seeds, we collect that data. And we also have a large tissue bank at the Botanic Garden that's managed by our genetics team. And so we also collect leaf tissue and dry it on silica gel. And then we have a whole library of dried leaf tissue that researchers can use to do genetic studies. And I mentioned that we need to be able to identify our plants when they're in bloom, but we also have to know what they look like in fruit. And so this is just a little anecdote from a real world example that has happened to me before. Um, the California jewel flower is a really lovely little endangered mustard that grows at Carrizo Plain and a few other places in the San Joaquin Valley. And during the flowering period, it looks nothing like Dobie pod, Tropidocarpum. Uh, you would never confuse them. The stature's not that similar. The flowers clearly are very different. They're both mustards. Um, and for that reason, their fruits look really similar. So when you come back and everything's brown and dried out, it can be super hard to tell who's who. So to help check ourselves, we always make sure that we do our research about what the fruits and the seeds look like. In this case, I've reversed it. The, uh, the jewel flower is the picture on the right. The doby pod is on the left. Um, but then we can also tag plants. So sometimes we'll put uh, colored tape on plants and then we pocket it when we get back. Uh, we don't leave it in the field. Or people mark plants with paint pens or strings uh, just to help cue yourself to make sure you're collecting the right thing and that you can find it when it's all dry and crispy. And then when we're ready to collect the seed, we do a bunch of tests in the field just to make sure everything is ripe. And you can really use most of your senses to do this. Uh, a lot of plants in California have sort of dry fruit types. And so we're looking often for things that are brown, that feel dry. We're looking for seeds that are hard and mature. If we cut them open, they shouldn't be green on the inside. And you can even, if it's a dry capsule, sometimes you can hear the seeds shaking in the pod and all those are good cues that the seed's ready to collect. And one thing that we do for our 
rare plant collections that a lot of people don't do when they collect common species is that we collect by maternal line. And what this means is that we keep the seeds from every individual plant separate. So if we go into a population and we collect from 50 plants, we leave with 50 envelopes. And so it takes a little more time and I'll explain some of the processing implications of that. But we also make sure that we cover as much of the genetic or as much of the geographic footprint of a given population as we can so that we can capture maximum genetic diversity. And this means that we try to sample at random, but humans aren't, you know, we're not inherently random. Um, but we try to collect from big plants and small plants and just get a real good sampling so that we have the best chance of capturing both rare and common alleles within that group. And then we look at the seeds and see, has anything been eating the seeds or the fruits? Do we see any fungal infections? Are the seeds infested with insects? All of this just to make sure that we are getting a good collection. So once we've figured this out and we've decided we're gonna make a collection, we use all kinds of methods. We do anything we can, whatever we need to. So that can be picking, plucking, pruning, stripping, swatting, shaking, and begging if we have to. Um, you can see our rare plant technician, Sean Carson, is collecting seeds of Pismoclarchia in this uh, video. And you can see that a lot of the plants still have flowers on them. But with Clarkias, they ripen sequentially and the earliest flowers open at the bottom of the stem. And so you can have a ripe fruit at the base and an open flower at the tip, but you have to be really careful that when you take that fruit off, you don't crack the stem and then wreck the chance of those subsequent flowers from making fruit. On the right is uh, my friend, Chris True. We worked together for a long time. We collected Joshua tree seeds for the Project Baseline project that um, Kristen mentioned, and that involved just really huge PVC pipes and we would be uh, hitting them off and then the other one of us would stand under the tree and try to catch it because we wanted to be sure that it came from that plant and that it wasn't a fruit that came from we didn't know where that was already on the ground. So that was kind of comical sometimes just in the beating desert sun poking these seeds off a tree and then trying to catch them. But we do whatever we got to do. Um, and so this year in 2020, this map shows everywhere that we made seed collections. And I'm really excited. If you remember the map with the purple dots, um, you can see that we really expanded our territory into the Eastern and Western Sierra Nevada. And so that was fun to get to work in new places and collect some things that hadn't been collected before. I estimate that we probably did at least 8,000 miles of driving this year to scout and collect all these populations. We added more than 70 collections to our conservation seed bank this year, so that was pretty pretty successful. That felt pretty good. Uh, those 70 collections comprised 37 different kinds of plants, and more than half of them had never been seed banked before. So that was also really nice. We feel like we're making a really good contribution to getting new genetics into the seed bank. And as you can see, for people from the area, we spent a fair amount of time in San Luis Obispo. Um, Slow County has just really great plant diversity and lots of rare plants, so I'm sure we'll be in your neck of the woods um, frequently for years to come. But what I wanted to do now is just take you on a little tour of this map and show you a few of the places and plants that we visited this year. So everything I'm gonna show you is something that we made a seed collection of this year in 2020. And we'll start in slow, start in the hometown. And we're starting with Pismo Clarkia. So this is a lovely field. I have a soft spot for Clarkias in general. Um, this is a beautiful little annual wildflower that's in the evening primrose family. Um, it's an endangered plant. It's listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, rare by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it has the highest rarity status with the CNPS as well. Um, this is a plant that's really geographically restricted. It only occurs in San Luis Obispo County and specifically in the small area in and around Pismo Beach. Um, it grows in sandy soils and it seems to prefer areas that don't have too much competition and some historic soil disturbance. We saw it a lot co-occurring with 
um, like year or two old gopher turnings. Um, and this plant is primarily threatened by development and road maintenance. All the populations that we worked on this year are in right of ways on the side of roads and could easily be mowed or run over or whatever. Um, and we mapped and collected this plant as part of a project with the California Invasive Plant Council. So we're working with them to assess the impacts of invasive plants on rare plants in the Central Coast region. And we're doing that by choosing a few focal taxa and setting up multi-year monitoring plots where we're using actually a modified CNPS rapid assessment protocol uh, to characterize the habitat. And then we're also taking sort of more fine scale data about percent cover and um, diversity of invasives and um, watching the abundance of the target species like Pismoclarchia really carefully. Eventually we plan to do weed removal and directly measure rare plant responses to weed control. And we're also working on a GIS risk assessment using spatial data to make predictions about the threat of invasive plants to rare plants. And then this is acting as a little bit of a ground truthing for that. And so um, you can see in the picture that a lot of the vegetation that's co-occurring with the Clarkia is brown. And I'm sure a lot of the CNPS folks know this. Um, Clarkia is one of their common name is Farewell to Spring. And that's because they tend to be relatively late bloomers. And so we made multiple sites to this, or multiple visits to this site and uh, learned that it's definitely harder to do our monitoring when all the co-occurring species are already brown and crispy. Um, but we made seed collections at three sites for this species this year. And at one of them, we observed really high herbivory where the fruits were being really carefully eaten off of the stems, we assume by small rodents. And so that's something that we're gonna be watching for in the future and that we've let people know um, at the US Fish and Wildlife Service that this could be a potential threat. Now we'll head south down the coast and go to Northern Santa Barbara County. So this is in the Gaviota Coast area. And our target here was Gaviota tar plant. This is another annual endangered plant in the sunflower family. And it's restricted to Santa Barbara County and especially is, is especially abundant in um, the Gaviota, Lompoc and Point Conception area. Uh, it can be difficult to identify because it has a lot of overlapping characters with its common relative, the grassland tarweed. One funny thing to me about this plant is that a lot of tarweeds can smell a little bit skunky. They're kind of strong. This one I think smells like pickles, which is just a strange fun fact about this plant. So after a long day of seed collecting, we smelled like pickles. Um, <laughs> and this is another one that is part of that Cal Ipsy project where we're monitoring the impacts of invasive plants on this species. And we noticed that it seems to prefer areas where exotic grass abundance is low. So it's possible that we might find a, an effect on this plant of, of the invasives. And another thing that was fun about this particular species is that our entire department at the garden worked on it this year. Our ecology team did pollinator monitoring at one site and our genetics team worked at multiple occurrences collecting tissues for a genetics study. And so we were able to collect seeds from several of the populations where they got genetic samples. So now we can marry those data and just have you know, better protection for the species. We can learn more and um, yeah, so that's cool. All right, now we're gonna go a little farther afield out to Tuolumne County to the Red Hills Recreation Management Area. Um, this is an area administered by the Bureau of Land Management and it's just spectacular. It has these beautiful red soils and a really strong serpentine influence. So lots of heavy metals and um, kind of unique soil type that leads to often a lot of interesting rare plants. Um, there are seven plants, seven species that are endemic to the Red Hills. And this was one of my favorite sites to work at this year, even though it was super hot by midsummer. Um, our target here was the Red Hills soap root. And this is related to the common soap roots that you would see if you were hiking in the Chaparral in Santa Barbara, Slow County. Um, 
This one is a perennial bulb. It's restricted to Tuolumne and El Dorado counties mostly. And it's a night bloomer. Some of the soap roots are. And so we scouted this during the day, but the flowers were all closed up. So we waited until after it got dark and went back out so that we could get an herbarium specimen with open flowers. And we got to see moths visiting. And I don't know, there's just something fun about doing night hikes. So that was a really, a really fun one to do this year. And this one we collected with funding from the Bureau of Land Management. So we've been working with them for a few years now to seed bank priority taxa that occur on, on BLM land. And so that's been a really fun project that's taken us to new areas in the state and just seeing lots of cool new plants. So now we'll head into the Central Valley a little bit for the spiny sepaled button celery. Uh, you can see Sean sitting in this now dry vernal pool, um, keying out the plant, making sure we're looking at the right thing. And eryngiums are just super neat, weird carrot family members. Um, they occur in vernal pools. These plants are, are uh, threatened by agriculture and development and hydrological changes that might affect the way that water pools and, and collects in the, in the vernal pools. Um, and they're super spiky. And one thing that we really underestimated was how long that soil really stays moist below ground. You can see that everything around Sean is totally dry and burned up. It was 100 degrees every day, but these plants stayed green for the longest time. We probably, this was our most difficult collection. We probably went back to this population four or five times, just thinking, okay, we haven't been there in three weeks and it's been 90 to hundred, it has to be ready. And then they would still be green. Um, but this one had never been seed banked in California before. So this was part of the California Biodiversity Initiative funding. And when we finally were able to collect it, Sean went out by himself and cut off those spiky heads, put them in paper bags, and then filled a huge pillowcase full of bags. And now these will be really interesting to clean. They're gonna, gonna be a little prickly, um, but it's, it's always exciting to bring a new species into conservation. And now we're gonna go to the Eastern side of the Sierra Nevada to Alabama Hills in Inyo County, another just super special and beautiful place. Um, after just sweating to death in the Central Valley and then coming over the mountains and seeing the snow, it was always really refreshing. And our target here was Inyo Facelia. And this is just a sweet diminutive little Facelia that grows in these alkaline soils in kind of uh, near seeps and, and meadowy type areas. And this is an annual plant. It doesn't have any federal or state protection, but it is a CNPS 1B. So it's a critically rare plant in California. And this was another one that was never seed banked before. And I have the quarter here for scale. This was one of the biggest plants we saw. You can see maybe in the upper left part of the photo, there are a couple of smaller plants. So this was one where we really had to look hard when we came back because these things were brown and crispy and shrunken and um, reminded us that good plant tagging is invaluable. Um, this plant occurs mostly in Inyo County as the name suggests, although it does creep over the border into Southern Mono County. And in Mono County, there's another rare Facelia called Mono Facelia that looks um, fairly similar to this. Uh, this plant is threatened mostly by trampling, grazing, and off-road vehicles. And it was another one that was really, really fun to work on. All right, now we're going to jump back down. We're going to go to LA for the Santa Monica Mountains Dudleya. This is a rare succulent that grows um, really in rocks. Uh, it's listed as threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's a CNPS 1B1. And this is a plant that we seed banked as part of a project working with our botany team at the garden. They spent the year, um, this last field season, doing a whole bunch of surveys and monitoring, looking at rare Dudleya populations that were affected by the Woolsey fire a few years ago. 
and they're doing monitoring for recovery. We're making conservation seed collections and then starting this winter, they're growing a ton of plants to figure out how to do eventual restoration. And for people who are familiar with deadlias, you know that they often like to grow in difficult places. And in this case, we were super lucky to have Stephen McCabe, who's just one of the world's foremost, foremost authorities on Dudleya, uh, do some rock climbing to make these collections for us. And that was a really fun day. He just roped up, scurried up, got seeds. And um, later this day, he tied off on a freeway guardrail and then rappelled into a canyon to make another collection. So. Uh, that's a mode of transportation I have not and probably will not use to make seed collections, but it was really cool to get to learn from him and see him in action. All right, our last stop is Santa Cruz Island. And this is actually not for a seed collection. Um, this is the island barberry. This is an endangered shrub that occurs now only on Santa Cruz Island. It was previously known from Santa Rosa and Anacapa Islands, but it hasn't been seen on those two islands in several decades. This plant was really hammered by all of the introduced grazing animals that were on the islands for a long, long time, but it managed to persist on Santa Cruz. But now all the animals have been removed, but this plant still suffers from low genetic diversity in the wild. So it's a clonal plant, reproduces vegetatively, um, genetics work done by the California Botanic Garden has shown that there are fewer than a dozen genotypes left on the island and they cannot self-pollinate. So plants are not making viable seed on the islands anymore. So I showed this, this was work we did in February before the pandemic and um, we took cuttings from all of the populations on the island from as many different stems that we thought could be unique individuals as possible. And we're propagating them in the nursery at the garden for a couple of reasons. One is so that we can keep XC2 collections at the garden that are genetically diverse. We'll also share those collections with other gardens so we have redundancy and multiple backups. Um, but then eventually the plan is to do restoration work on Santa Cruz Island and then to reintroduce this plant to the islands that it has been extirpated from. Um, this is just an example of the kind of comprehensive work we have to do to make sure that we can save all plants. And I think it also really highlights the importance of horticulture in our work as well as collecting seeds. And so that just scratches the surface of all the beautiful plants that we got to chase this year. Um, but okay, so we made a ton of seed collections. Now what do we do? We have a lot of cleaning and curation to do. Um, we have a lot of tools to help us clean all of those seeds. Sieves are almost always involved just to help separate fruit material from seeds. Uh, the video you can see on the right is a seed blower and that uses air to separate the seeds from the chaff, which is just accessory plant material, and also from seeds that are not likely to be viable. So anything that's really lightweight will fall into those cups uh, higher up on the, on the blower, and then all the good viable seeds stay in that mug. So you have like a stein of good seeds at the end, um, and that really helps us with our processing. And then believe it or not, we sometimes blend seeds. This is mostly for manzanitas. So they have those nice big berries, but they have that super hard stone in the middle. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll tape off the blades because we don't want to obliterate them. And then we'll make a little bit of a manzanita berry slurry and that helps us get that fleshy material off more quickly. And you might remember that picture of Sean uh, with his mask on holding a bag of uh, Santa Barbara honeysuckle berries. This is a locally rare plant that we collected this year. And when we have things that have fleshy fruits like this, time is really of the essence. So you have a bag of these really juicy berries. We need to keep them cool so that they don't rot. And then we take them into the lab and we push them through sieves and wash them to get all that fleshy pulp out. 
And then we have to spread them out and let them completely dry before we start to package them because we don't want them to have any extra moisture. And then once we've done that, we can do the fine work of counting our seeds and dividing them. And in normal times, we have a wonderful seed team of volunteers that helps us. We even have seed cleaning parties where people at the garden help us. Um, but I mentioned that we collect by maternal line. And so we come back, we have 50 manila envelopes, but then we have to process each envelope individually because we don't wanna mix up our genotypes. And we also have to divide each of those envelopes into multiple envelopes. So we send a portion of all of our collections to the National, C the National Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation, which is our national seed bank in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's run by the USDA. So every collection gets split and 40% stays with the garden in our conservation collection. 40% goes to an LGRP for backup storage. And then 20% goes to what we call a curation package. And there's one for us and one for NLGRP. And those are packets of seeds that we mix together the lines and we use them to test viability over time. So that way, when we need to check on the seeds, we don't have to take the whole collection out. We can just have one set of seeds that gets thawed and refrozen because every time you thaw the, the seeds, they lose a little bit of viability. We also have a seed imaging program. This is a, um, a poster that was made by um, some of our technicians as well as a student intern that we had. And this is great for outreach, but also for research. It helps us to identify seeds more accurately. We can use them for publications and we can also just showcase that really beautiful seed diversity that most people don't ever get to see. So, after we've done all of that division and cleaning, we dry down our seeds. As I mentioned, we wanna make sure that we strip out any extra moisture. We don't pull out intracellular water, but just any accessory water that's sort of uh, moving around the, the seeds because we don't want them to burst in the freezer. And then we package them up, we seal them into these foil pouches. We find their spot in the library you can see that this tote is particularly full. Sean and I are in an expansion phase right now. I think that's when we actually just expanded. We seal them up and we pop them in the freezer. But I think one common misconception is that once things go into the freezer, they're there forever and they're sort of there for posterity. But I really wanna make the argument that, and it's not an argument, seeds are alive. These are living collections. So I mentioned that we have to do periodic viability testing to look for decreases in viability. And that cues us that we either need to grow out that collection in the greenhouse and collect those seeds and put them back in the freezer, or we might wanna revisit wild populations, or ideally we can make a plan to use those seeds before they die and recollect from the wild or bulk some of them up. We've been working on a project with Island Partners where we're using a mix of seeds from our seed bank as well as seeds that we've collected over the years during the project where we're growing out a bunch of annual plants and we're doing seed bulking. So we're growing seeds to make more seeds and then we're eventually going to do restoration work out on the islands with several of these endangered rare plants. So they don't sit in the freezer forever and they shouldn't and I just, I want everybody to think of seeds as alive because they are and they're future plants. So uh, we try to be good stewards of them. And that's all I had today. If you wanna learn more, um, you can go to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden website. We have a webpage about our department and all the cool work that everyone at the garden's doing. California Plant Rescue has a website and we have a lot of public facing features if you're interested in tracking our progress and see how we do. Um, and if you have any questions that I can't answer now or if you just wanna say hi, um, that's my email address. So thank you. Heather, I know that um, one of the downsides of this Zoom, uh, Zoom situation is that you can't see all our smiling faces and hear our applause. <laughs> But I just want to say, um, I think on behalf of everyone here, that was wonderful. The applause mm -hmm. are happy. 
just Zoom style. So thank you so much. Uh, man, that made me so excited for spring. <laughs> just as every other time I've um, interfaced with either someone that works at the garden um, or uh, learned about some of the work you guys do, I'm so impressed and blown away about all the stuff that you're doing. So um, oh, thank you so much for sharing. That was that was lovely. Um, I'll just put this out there. If anybody does have any questions that they want to start throwing into the chat, I'll keep an eye on that and we can have a little dialogue. Um, and while people are thinking of um, questions, I just wanted to share. I mean, I think we got um, up into the mid 60s uh, for participation tonight, which was awesome. We had people join us from all over California. We had someone from Alabama, which I think is someone that you know, probably oh. joining from Chicago. Um, so we really, we really attracted quite a crowd this evening. Um, I can't find it now because there's been so much excited chatter and so many thank yous and so many compliments on your photos. Um, so I can't find the exact question, but someone did ask, and I'm going to put this out there as your first question. If the garden ever works with student interns, I think there's a couple students on the call tonight and they, as I are impressed with the work you do and probably want to join you. <laughs> Yeah, we do. Um, so the garden, we don't have our own internship program, but we have worked with a lot of students in different ways. Um, we have a really great program at one of our local community colleges where they have an internship program that they're able to send us students. But um, yeah, we've worked with students for short term and longer term projects. And um, we, we actually are going to be getting a student intern through a fellowship program with the US Fish and Wildlife Service next year, which is pretty exciting. So um, we're all really passionate about what we do and about helping to train the next generation of conservationists. So um, if you're a student and you're interested, definitely reach out to us. Awesome, good, good info. Um, Melissa, I see that you, um, I think you have unmuted yourself. Do you wanna do what we did last time with the questions? Did you want to uh, sure. Those? What did we do? We alternated, right? We alternated. Yeah. <laughs> just so, just so, more voices. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Um, so you took a question here, Charlie. Put it, go ahead and throw it in the chat for us, Charlie. We're going to try to go in order so we don't I, miss I, it. I, I haven't quite figured out the chat. Anyway, uh, uh, two questions. I'd heard a rumor that one of the, uh, the seed banks was being affected by global warming. And the other question is the Ventura Marsh milk, Ventura Marsh milk ditches. That's part of your collection. Okay, so the first part had to do with global warming, seed banks being affected by global warming. I didn't catch the second part. Did you, Heather? Oh, I did. Yeah. Ventura He's got Marsh it. Milk <laughs> Ventura Marsh milk fish, yeah. Yeah, so um, those full barred seed bank that I showed in the first photo, um, they they built that, as I mentioned, into a mountain surrounded by permafrost on an island in Norway, thinking even if all power is lost, the permafrost will keep these seeds cold. And then you're exactly right, global climate change is real and permafrost is melting and they had a flood in their facility um, because they thought they had permanent ice, but they did not. Um, so they've been trying to figure out how to deal with that. And actually the reason that the, um, the US National Seed Bank is in Fort Collins is because it's at high elevation and the air is drier there. And so that's part of their backup plan is that if something were to happen and that whole facility lost power for days on end, um, it's cooler and drier there. So they feel like the seeds would survive longer. Um, the second question was about if we have Ventura Marsh Milk Batch in our collection, and we do. Uh, and our garden, our horticulture department was involved in doing some of the growing of plants that went into the restorations that have happened. And we're also uh, waiting to hear about a proposal we put in with CNPS as the lead investigators to try to get seeds from herbarium specimens of Ventura marsh milk vetch to see if we can find novel genetic material that we can grow out and introduce into those restored populations. So um, it's definitely a plant we're thinking about. <laughs> wow, good questions. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, Kristen. 
<laughs> I was gonna say, I'll, I'm gonna start here with Wilson. I think that's the, there's a lot of comments here, but I think Wilson had the first questions other than the student question. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna start with these three questions and then we'll just go down from there. Um, so question one, can Phytophthora be identified at the seed level um, and how to differentiate from other pathogens? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I am not a Phytophthora expert and I don't know. Um, I mean, I would imagine that if it was contaminating seeds, you could identify it. Um, but I, I really don't know about that. I haven't, haven't done it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good and tricky question. Yeah. You're on a roll, Kristen. Why don't you go through all three of those? <laughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, so also uh, from Wilson, what is the oldest germinated California native seed? If you know, that's pretty, pretty <sighs> question. Wow. Um, I don't know, but um, yeah, that's a hard question because a lot of people have been saving seeds of California natives outside of seed banks. Right. Um, the, you know, California Botanic Garden, previously Rancho Santa Ana, they're our biggest seed bank in California and they have a really um, diverse and, and a collection that goes back a long way. Um, so as far as doing it under controlled circumstances, it might be them, but um, certainly anybody who's working on these herbarium type projects, you could potentially, you know, pull a seed off of a sheet and, and germinate something very old that nobody was trying to seed bank. Um, so sorry, Wilson, I'm 0 for 2 on your questions. <laughs> they're just, they're good questions. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. You said your oldest um, collection is Napoma lupin from 85. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Okay, last question here from this little set is, how, and this, this is an easy one, <laughs> softball here. How often do you perform your viability tests? Yeah, so um, it really varies, but sort of standard best practice would be to do it um, a one year. So some people do viability tests via germination right away when they make a collection, and that way you have a baseline. Um, we do a proxy for that by doing cut tests. So it's presumed viability just as, you know, how many seeds look healthy. Um, but then viability testing at 1, 10, 20, 30 years is fairly common. Sometimes people will test more frequently if they are particularly concerned about a certain collection or have a suspicion that the seeds won't live for that long. Um, but yeah, so it varies, but those are sort of the standard benchmarks. Nice. Okay, so the next question uh, has to do with volunteers again, um, specifically spiny sepal button celery. Uh, shall we say we've already addressed with that one? But it sounds like somebody wants to specifically help with that one. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, usually at the end of my talks, I make the hard sell to like come clean seeds with us. But we have a very paired back volunteer program now, but if there was someone with a special interest in cleaning difficult and uncomfortable seats, you know, shoot me an email. <laughs> yeah, send an email. Um, I'm nice. going to take the, I'm going to take one more. Um, yeah. There's another one. I, I think really maybe what we, the, the questioner means is what, what temperature are the seeds kept at? She's asking, what temperature are the seeds frozen at? Obviously they freeze at 32, right? But um, or yeah, maybe yeah. that's not so obvious, but the question is what temperature are the seeds frozen at? Right, so our seeds are stored at minus 20 degrees C. Oh, okay. So Celsius, which is about minus four Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Minus four. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, Kristen? Yeah, the next one, uh, if you know uh, how many seed banks total are in California. Oh, um, let me do some quick mental calculating. <laughs> Maybe more than I would have guessed. Um, 
I can think of at least eight off the top of my head. Um, so yeah. Quick, quick follow up question for me. Do you know in terms of size where uh, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden ranks in that list of the ones you can think of? Yeah, so um, until very recently, we were number two. Um, California Botanic Garden has everybody beat by an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude almost. Um, but the Center for Plant Conservation several years ago relocated their headquarters to San Diego Zoo Global in um, Escondido. And so they have been really ramping up their conservation seed program. And so they have surpassed us. So now we're number three and they're number two. <laughs> Got it. Great. Um, here's a good one. Uh, given that these are rare plants, how do you decide how many seeds to collect from a population? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I saw that was from my friend, Sarah. Hi, Sarah, thanks for <laughs> So she's our Alabama uh, <laughs> participant. Nice. Um, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, sort of international standards are that you collect no more than 5% of available seed. And so in practice, what that ends up looking like is really different depending on the size of the population and how, how many uh, available fruits there are on a given visit. Um, we try to collect from 50 individuals at least when we're out, but some rare plant populations don't even have that many plants. Um, so it can really vary. And we have had a lot of conversations about what is the value of a very small collection. And we all agree that if it's a very rare plant with very few individuals, even if you can only get one fruit, uh, that is still really important. And so it runs the gamut. We, uh, we have some very small collections that might only be a few maternal lines and might have 30 seeds. And then we have some that are really large collections with plants that are prolific and make a lot of seeds. And those will have thousands of seeds in a collection. So we make a lot of decisions um, in the field depending on what things look like. Yeah, so it sounds like a minimum of 50 then. Is that that's what we shoot for, but we can't always meet that and that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice feedback. Uh, our, our next question actually comes with some feedback for you. Uh, Dr. Schneider is a badass. <laughs> Will, I, I just wanted to share that. It's, yeah, it was a really great presentation. And will this recorded presentation be available somewhere? Did I lose you, Melissa? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my cat just uh, yelled at me, so I picked her up. Uh, I'm here. Got it. I and, guess that's uh, actually a question for you, Melissa. Where do we post our recorded presentations? I think the goal is to put it on the website. I haven't checked to see if our, uh, I guess the goal is to put it on the web. I'm going to okay, leave so it at that. CN CNP is <laughs> slow. Um, yes. No promise on timeline, but um, you can yes. e email, yeah, one of us, I guess, if you're looking for it. Yeah, cmpsslow.org. Our webmaster is pretty busy with the sale right now, so it won't go up right away, um, right. but it'll get up there hopefully eventually. Um, what else do we have? Um, Dave Chipping. Oh, we have a question involved in the seed collecting of Gaviota tar plant at the Strauss Wind Project. And it looks like someone already did, yes, that was already answered in the chat. Yes, we made oh. conservation collections. Yeah. Multiple element occurrences at the Strauss. So it looks like Dave Chipping's question got answered in the chat. Got mm -hmm. it. And then there's another long, longer one. How do you see the seed bank moving forward into the coming decades as an institution in society? What societal changes does the data indicate would be most beneficial to the safeguarding of biodiversity on the central coast? Where is this knowledge most needed right now? You can, yeah, that's a, a long winded question, Heather. <laughs> you might look at the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... The, the consensus in California and a lot of places is that the 
uh, top threats to rare plants are development, invasive plants, and climate change. So I think as far as societal changes, uh, we need to legislate and change our behavior to acknowledge that climate change is real and it's happening and it's having an impact on everything that lives on planet Earth. Um, and I think making informed and long-term thinking decisions about where we put development is really important. And I think um, just kind of that old adage of thinking about how this will affect you know, seven generations beyond us when we make a decision. Um, a lot of rare plants, not a lot, there are a handful of rare plants that suffer from things like altered hydrology where all the water that we're pumping out of the environment is lowering the water table. And that's something that I'm sure nobody thought about when we started doing that. Um, but now we're seeing, you know, whole ecosystems really change because that underground water isn't there anymore. And rare plants, I think, are often the canary in the coal mine signaling, hey guys, things are going south here, uh, better do something. So um, I think that's, I think those are some of the big things is just making really, really different decisions about how we all live and, um, and treat our planet. But as far as the sort of the role of seed banks moving forward, um, I think that it's really exciting and hopeful that people know about this now. When I say, you know, we have a seed bank at the garden, people have an idea of what that means. I think that's a really positive thing for the future of conservation. I think that uh, California is often a role model for the rest of the country. And I hope that other states will make big investments in things like conservation seed banking like California has. Um, so although I would describe myself as not an optimist, um, those things make me hopeful. <laughs> and, I, and, and one of my favorite things about my job is that I get to go to work every day and feel like I'm chipping away at these problems and helping to save plants. And that all feels pretty good. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. All right, uh, great. Are there, is there more? No, I think I think <laughs> all really great questions. So thank you everyone for engaging and, and providing those questions. Um, and I think that's the end of it. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't see any more questions, so. Yeah, I, it just occurred to me, um, uh, this is going off the topic of our presentation uh, to CNPS business a little bit, and I don't know if we wanna do that. Um, are there closing thoughts on um, Heather's presentation? Uh, it was great, by the way, Heather. I loved how you put in the little videos of, you know, people collecting plants and doing little things like that, inserting that in. It, it really made things alive, come alive yeah. in the presentation. Oh, thanks. That was yeah, great. and thank you guys for inviting me. I've always really admired the slow chapter. You guys are a super active group. And um, so I was excited. I wish I could have met you in person, but it's also really cool to have friends and family from all over the country get to participate <laughs> yeah that's yes nice. that's nice yeah. um i uh, i did want to tell our general members were you going to say something Kristen? sorry i didn't know I, I was going to say i think feel free to go ahead okay okay great um you're getting a few more thank yous um in the chat i did want to remind our membership that um and I don't want to put Kristen on the spot here, but um, we will uh, we'll have an update. I'm not sure if we're going to have a December meeting. I think we are, but we'll have an oh, update. Yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll have an update on our officer situation. Also, we uh, okay. Well, that'll be that'll be coming because um, we either need to have an election or move into the new year with our existing officers. And so we'll fill you in on, on that in the coming weeks. Um, that will be coming, yes. that will be coming along in the future also. Um, anything else? I don't think so, other than just a reiteration of a, of a huge thank you to, to Heather. And I don't know if you did open the chat, but it is just filled with thank yous and um, appreciation and compliments on your photos and the video. Uh, it looks like your mom joined us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a <mom> supporter. 
All right. Uh, so proud mom. So just, yeah, a huge thank you. This was a lovely presentation. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. Very good. All right. And so thank you again from me and thanks to all our members and non-members. And we hope to see you again real soon. Yes. All right. Good night all. <laughs> thank you. Bye.